And last but not least, we have uh, Luke Sneringer from Google. Uh, as I mentioned previously, he's the lead for API design for Google Cloud. Uh, as part of this effort, he created the API improvements proposal system uh, for standardizing API design guidelines um, and wrote many of those guidelines in the process. He also wrote Google's API linter and designed Google's automated code generation data model and process for API client libraries. Sounds <laughs> pretty impressive. So uh, Luke is dialing in from Boulder Creek, California, uh, where he lives with his wife and their three cats. Um, he'll be discussing API simplicity and consistency. And I do hope your cats will be assisting in this presentation, Luke. Uh, thanks for taking the time to speak today. I'll hand it over to you. The chances of my cats appearing in this presentation has gone significantly up because there's a bed over there. Um, so hi, my name is Luke Snerringer. I'm here to talk about uh, API simplicity and consistency um, and how to manage design and governance at scale. Um, so if you don't know anything about me, the only thing you really know, need to know about me is I run the API design program at Google. Um, I am responsible for uh, going through and trying to make sure that our entire corpus um, meets you know, quality standards. I've been doing this work since 2018 when I took it over from the person who did it before me. Um, and really there's three goals around that effort. Um, the first goal is simplicity, um, something that was being discussed in the last talk, which is we want um, our APIs to do things as simply as possible and we want to take complexity on ourselves rather than giving it to our users. Um, consistency, which is that we want our APIs to be consistent with each other. Um, you should be able to take things from one API and often pass them to others. Um, there are, are other needs that are very difficult to run consistency and then documentation, um, which is self-explanatory. But there's a big challenge, especially um, especially on consistency, but really on all three of these, which is that Google's immense size entails a combinatorial explosion of communication channels. Um, we now ha uh, have over 100,000 engineers. Um, and in fact, those engineers often don't know who to talk to or know what each other's are doing because there's just so incredibly much to keep up with. Um, let's just, for example, talk about just how difficult this is. Um, one of the things that I do internally, I'll talk about this in a little bit, is I give design classes. And we go through in these classes and talk about, like, what's the right way to do some of these things? Um, what's the right way to specify a language code? Is it to use an enum or a string? Um, and if I was giving this, uh, you know, actually in person, I would actually ask for opinions. And usually there's people who favor both of them. There's advantages for each. Uh, enums give you type safety. They give you telling you what uh, languages are supported. Uh, on the other hand, the string is an international standard. Um, it makes it so that you can make changes without altering the interface. Um, so there's reasons to do both. And usually, even people who favor one or the other will agree that there is validity in the choice that they don't actually prefer. But what happens if you do them both? This is what we actually did. Um, we have the speech API, which takes uh, an audio recording and gives you a transcript. And we have the Cloud Natural Language API, which takes um, a transcript and tells you about it. And if you do both of them, then it becomes infeasible to pass a value from one to the other. And these are APIs that you can absolutely want to use together. Similarly, adding one more API, we have this wonderful situation, which is um, these are all float fields that are between 0 and 1 that are used in three of Google's APIs. And this sort of seems fine until you realize that score in natural language doesn't mean the same thing as score in vision. Well, that's great. Now I you know, get, make a guess on one of them and I rudely find out that I'm wrong. Um, it turns out that score in natural language does mean the same as confidence. Thankfully, we got one thing right and confidence does mean confidence specifically, uh, consistently. I'm confident in that. Um, and of course, there's these other things which you know clearly none of them may mean the same thing. Oh, except two of them do. And all of that sounds kind of frustrating, but it's so much worse when I tell you something that you have no reason to know, which is that all of these people sit next to each other. All three of these API teams sit in Kirkland on the first floor in the same building. Oops, that's how hard it is to be consistent. And so, Realizing that and realizing that consistency was important, we decided that we wanted to put together a design program. Again, users don't just use one API, they use lots of them together. Um, consistency gives users this concept called cognitive leverage. 
Um, it also enables more robust tooling. Um, there was a mention in the last talk about auto generation. We auto generate client libraries and we want those client libraries to work as well as possible and be as idiomatic as possible. Um, we have auto generated docs um, that probably aren't as good as readme's. We have numerous other like tools that we build on top of our APIs. And we have a lot more that are coming. We're working on auto generated CLI tools, IDE integrations, uh, GraphQL shim, where we provide GraphQL reads across our entire corpus, Kubernetes shims for the same. Every single one of those things is easier if we're consistent because they have sanitized inputs. So understanding that we needed to do this, we created a program called API governance, basically our attempt to have design at scale. Um, and what we've learned over the last several years is that governance programs are incredibly difficult to maintain and scale well. Um, there are several reasons for this. Um, consistency tends to require keeping the team as small as possible, um, and a lot of, and, but a lot of its work can't be automated. Um, Google publishes you know, tens of entire APIs and thousands of API updates every year, um, and all of those running through a very limited number of people creates a problem. Um, it you know, creates throughput issues and such. Um, this is not the type of work that VPs tend to be very likely to want to fund. Um, you know, you're asking me to, you tell a VP, you're asking me to go fund someone who's going to go look at every API and, and talk about, you know, nebulous quality issues and consistency issues. That's pretty hard to justify. Um, and again, the number of API producer teams is constantly increasing. Um, it's also challenging because a lot of the, these issues are more art than science. So there's a decent amount of debating with people. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And so in order to try to create a design program, we basically did four things um, roughly, roughly in sequence. Um, the first thing we did was we had a, you know, an education program where we tried to teach people how to design APIs well. The next thing we did was we instituted a review program. Um, the thing after that that we did was we published standards, guidelines, essentially. And then the fourth thing that we did was effectively uh, linting. So let's talk first about education. So the idea was that we were going to have a sort of multifaceted approach to educating engineers and teaching them how to design APIs well. Um, we created an API design class. This is a three hour course that we teach internally uh, along with an exercise um, that was uh, for a while, it was actually mandatory that engineers that were working on APIs take it. Um, it's no longer mandatory, but it was for several years. Um, the next thing that we did, and we offered consulting on demand. Um, so you could schedule a meeting and, and, you know, someone would come out and whiteboard with you and try to help you design a good API. And, you know, we set up discussion lists, which is exactly what you think it is. Well, what was, what were the effects? How did this work? Um, well, our designs got better a little, at least, um, we, we did do, we became noticeably more simple and more consistent after we did this. Um, but it was by far imperfect and had many scaling issues. Um, just because you've put out an education program doesn't mean anybody knows about it. Um, and it turns out that Google is large. Um, teams often didn't know who to ask for help. Um, and then even when they did ask for help, you know, you can get all kinds of different information on a discussion list. Um, so our guidance was very inconsistent based on who you asked, um, what mood the person was in when you asked, uh, what they thought a year ago might have changed from what they thought now. Um, as mentioned, you know, you, you don't get a lot of headcount for that. And oh my goodness gracious, there was so much flying around. Uh, it turns out that we have API teams in you know 20 plus different offices around the world. Um, and a lot of these things required being in person. Certainly teaching the class was in person um, and it had an exercise that couldn't be done remotely. So there was tons of you know four or five people having to go all over the place to, to keep this going. Um, after doing this, we instituted a review program. The idea is here is more or less what you think it is. We put up a roadblock in our internal system and said, you can't launch an API until somebody on this team has looked at it and said that it's good. And that person will argue with you if they don't like something. Um, this was um, reasonably not as poorly received as you might expect. Um, it was reasonably well received. It was originally run by one person, which became two people and which ultimately capped out about three people. The idea was that the producer team and the design team are uh, jointly responsible for overall quality. Uh, these are issues with the API itself, um, but that the design team specifically was responsible for consistency. Um, in other words, it wasn't every API producer's job to know what every other API producer was doing. The horizontal team was responsible for that and responsible for trying to say, oh, hey, you're doing X. This other team already did that. Will you copy them as much as possible? 
Um, the effect at scale was that it did make a dramatic improvement. Having the same sets of eyes looking at everything in the corpus was incredibly affected. Um, it provided a canonical authority that was reasonably centralized and concentrated. On the other hand, um, the reviewer pool was still limited. It never had more than three people effectively. Um, there was still a large amount of tribal knowledge. Um, basically, a lot of decisions became, this is what the reviewer said. And if that reviewer ever got hit by a bus, then no one would really have any way of finding what that person had said in the past, at least not in a way that was searchable and reasonable. And so there was a whole bunch of information about our corpus and the consistency of our corpus that was locked into the head of a very small number of people. Um, it also made the reviewers feel, spend a lot of effort on things that felt like they shouldn't matter. Um, you could have long drawn out debates on whether a field was called num instances or instance count, um, which really feels like a waste of everybody's time. Um, it's really frustrating for reviewers to have to go argue over small things, and it feels to the producer like it shouldn't matter. Um, but in fact, to our users, it does, because again, they expect to see the same thing consistently as much as is possible. And again, headcount. Um, so about a year and a half ago, we moved toward having um, detailed published guidelines. The idea was that we would write um, proposals or guidelines that would be the canonical authority on what Google's API design would look like. Um, they, we called them API improvement proposals. They are public at google.aip.dev. You can go look at them. And the idea was that each one is a short document that explains, here's how to do this particular topic right. So if it's a topic about how to handle a long running operation that you have to pull and you have to go see when it's done, um, we have a pattern for that. We have a pattern for um, what to name fields. We have a pattern for e-tags. We have a pattern for singletons. We have patterns for all these things. And they're all, they're given these numbered documents kind of like RFCs. Um, and then we created an internal exam so people could know would know the content. So you can and it re, and it is somewhat replaced the class. So you can go take an exam if you are a Google employee, and it gives you uh, one or more questions for each document. That by answering those, you will have had to go read the documents. So it was a, pe a pedagogical tool. Um, so what were what were its effects? Well, the first thing and something that surprised me was that it dramatically reduced the back and forth in reviews, uh, both before the reviews happened and the, the back and forth of the reviews themselves. Um, it turns out that there were a lot of people who, if you're their design reviewer and you say that you think they should do X, Y, Z thing um, and they didn't want to, they would argue with you. But as soon as you said, hi, I'm your design reviewer and I wrote this document on this official looking website that says you should do the exact same thing with the exact same difficulty, they would shrug their shoulders and say, okay, um, it turns out that a, a shocking number of debates were ended by appealing to, in my case, what was my own authority, having written down a document somewhere that I could point to. Um, it dramatically reduced tribal knowledge. Um, a lot of times a, an issue would come up, you know, for a year or so, an is issues would come up in API reviews, and it would end with, oh, we need a document for that. We need an AIP for that. And then we'd go write one. And then we had it for the next person. Um, as mentioned, uh, I already said this, it was considered, it was viewed by API producers as significantly more authoritative once it was written down. Um, even though there wasn't really all that much of a difference, um, but it was perceived as being much more authoritative. It's also very easy to cite. Um, so we have internal discussions at Google that, that are of the form AIP-134 says to do this, and everyone knows what link to go to to go find that document and can find things quickly in it. And it also allowed for me to expand the reviewer pool a little bit. Um, so we were able to go from having about three reviewers to having five reviewers. Um, again, I still only have one headcount, which is me, but uh, my team of volunteers could increase somewhat. Um, there's some things that don't work. We designed it to be extensible. So the idea was that individual you know, product areas could go and add their own standards that only applied to them. The extension, the extensibility model is terrible. Um, it, has, it has been used, but it's sort of this sort of known wart. Um, and also, it's really difficult to handle internal only guidance. So if we have to write guidance that says, you know, here's how to configure this specific tool to get the outcome you want, we don't have any good way of doing that right now. Um, and the fourth thing that we did was a linter. Um, the idea was, you know, exactly what you think it was. We have our interface definition language. It's used by almost everything at Google. Um, and we wrote a linter for that. 
And, and any AIP rule that I could find that I could write into code, I did. And I um, you know, forced everyone to run it over their API surfaces after a beta period. And the idea was that anything that I could catch in code, I wanted to catch in code. Um, it's, we have a hard rule that any rule that's a lint rule has to be an expression of guidance in English and an AIP so that they, they mirror one another. Um, and it, it's run against most public facing APIs at Google. Um, there's a few exceptions. Some APIs are like so old and so legacy that it would just be a, like an annoyance and we haven't gotten up to code yet. Um, and then there's a few like, um, we have some that are like for healthcare devices where uh, they have to meet external specifications that just take precedence over ours. And so they turn it off. And this effect at scale has been fantastic. It's improved the review experience for both producers and reviewers. Reviewers get to focus on higher level issues uh, rather than like go rename this field from X to Y. Reviews also went much faster. Um, it used to be that reviews could easily draw out into months. Um, now we almost never have reviews that go months. The long ones go a couple of weeks and the short ones go, um, and the short ones usually go, you know, a day or two at most. Um, and it's much more pleasant for API producers because code is faster than people. Um, you know, they get that instant feedback. Um, we still do all four of these. Like no, no item on this list replaced the others. Um, however, each new governance system that we introduced reduced the load on the ones that came before it. Um, you know, it made it so that fewer classes were needed. You know, so the AIPs made it so that we didn't need as many classes. The linter made it so that the reviews went faster. Um, we don't currently have any plans to add a fifth system, although that doesn't preclude that we may think of one in the future. Um, and again, we're still at one headcount. There's, you know, there's still just me. Um, and then I have a team of you know, volunteers who work who work on other systems that volunteer some of their time to to do API governance. Um, so that's a sort of a description of what we do, how we do it, and sort of what's worked and hasn't worked for us. Um, I do want to mention as a plug um, that you can adopt AIPs if you're interested. Um, we have a cross company task force. It currently consists of Google, Netflix, Oracle, uh, IBM, and a couple others I might be forgetting. Um, where we're working on creating generic AIPs, basically the idea that a startup starting from scratch could adopt, um, you know, AIP standards that would be likely to work for them um, and with lessons learned from what we did wrong. Um, these are more REST JSON focused. The Google ones tend to be focused on the protocol buffer IDL, which isn't all that widely used outside of Google. Um, it covers multiple interface definition languages, and it's also free of baggage. There's things that we only recommend because, because we do them. We think they're mistakes now, but because we do them, we don't want to change it because that would make life harder for everyone for a decade. Um, so we're working on improving the extensibility model. Um, we, the idea right now, AAP.dev directs to Google.aap.dev. The idea is that there will eventually be, you know, Salesforce.aap.dev, Netflix AAP.dev, and so on and so forth. Um, and so if you have a company and you're interested in being involved with this effort, um, then reach out to me. Um, we'd love to have, you know, more people with eyes on this and trying to get these standards to be as useful as possible. The idea would be that companies will extend the generic AIPs with appropriate tooling to support it, uh, to override guidance that they dislike, add guidance specific to them, and so on and so forth. But there would be consistent numbering. So you could compare, say, you know, Google's AIP 140 to Netflix's AIP 140 and see where they differ. Um, and then again, some uh, additional support for this in the winter is planned. Uh, there are some challenges around this, um, especially with ecosystems that are sufficiently different. Um, so our stuff tends to be focused on REST JSON. If you use GraphQL, like what's the equivalent of get for a single resource in GraphQL? Um, Kubernetes is similar. Um, so we're working through those challenges now. Uh, our, our Netflix people are very interested in that particular problem. Um, if you're interested in adopting this at your company, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, reach out to me. My email is in the slides, um, and I'm sure it's on the API Days website and such. Um, just to wrap up, um, so some things that we've we've learned. First of all, I think everyone knows this, but API design is hard, but it's even harder at scale. Um, it's difficult to design one API. It's really difficult to design 100 APIs and have them all uh, feel remotely consistent and like a like a consistent experience. Um, consistency at a large organization is plainly daunting. Um, and also, we learn over time. We realize that some of the patterns we recommended are unwise, but existing APIs are difficult to change, and so it creates drift. Um, we at Google started ad hoc. We had things like education and reviews. Uh, we found that we needed, in order to scale, we needed standards and we needed linting. 
um, engineers are more receptive to them, codes faster than people, and so on and so forth. And so we augmented our ad hoc programs with systems um, that ease train on the ad hoc programs, but still allow the ad hoc programs to do the things that can't be done with machines and can't be generalized. And again, you can adopt some of our work for free, and we would love for you to do so. And that's all I got. Oh, cool. Thanks, Luke. Um, I think we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so Srinivas has asked, are the public guidelines available for public, uh, sorry, are the published guidelines available for public use? Yes, uh, they're at google.aip.dev, um, which is a link on one of the previous slides. Again, AIP, the misspelling, the common misspelling of API, because um, it stands for API Improvement Proposals. So if you go to aip.dev, you can see all of them. Um, they, you can browse them. There's about 50 or so individual documents. I wrote most of them, um, and then they get approved by, by internal teams. Um, the generic ones are not yet public. Um, the, there's, like I said, there's a working group that's working on those. Um, the goal of the generic ones is to be more focused on the REST interface and not the specific IDLs. Um, so, not, so, you know, we'll talk about what the REST interface would be, and then it will give examples of how to implement it in Protobuf or OpenAPI or whatever else. Um, those are forthcoming, and I expect we'll see them in early 2021. Um, Sweet. Um, and is the linter only for internal use? The linter is also public. Um, it is at linter.aip.dev. Um, however, it has a somewhat important restriction, which is that it runs on protobuf files. So if you're willing to define your API in protobuf, you can use our linter. Um, if you want to define it in open API or something similar, then you can't use our linter because it doesn't know how to read open API files. Um, we are working on expanding that as well. We'd like it to support more IDLs. Um, I don't know if we're, we might do that in one of two ways. We might do it by writing a separate linter for each IDL, um, and we might do it by trying to use the same one uh, we talked about maybe abandoning the actual like core linter and extending ESLint instead, um, but that decision hasn't been made yet. Um, my the uh, the equivalent of me at IBM is currently working on an open API linter, um, which I believe they are planning to open source um, as part of this effort. All right. Uh We've got one. So the linter supports um, protocol buffer, buffers. So is there one for JSON? Um, so there's no real way to specify an entire API in JSON. You can you can use JSON schema to to express a particular struct, but JSON itself is, I mean, it's sufficient in that you can design some kind of JSON schema that describes an API. Um, most people use something like Open API for that. Um, if you want to serve a REST JSON API that you specify using protocol buffers, though, you can do that. Um, Google has uh, a platform that serves it, which is called Endpoints, um, and I believe there's a couple others as well. Um, and there is a canonical mapping between protobuf and JSON files. Um, if you're defining an open API, which is the most common way that people define REST JSON interfaces, um, currently our linter doesn't do that. It is planned. Awesome. Um, Chris asked, um, how long did this process take from where you started to now? Uh, how long did this, oh, that's a great question. I'm not entirely sure that I know the answer to this question. Um, so I, so I, I didn't, I wasn't here at the very beginning, um, but we started having an API governance program at the beginning of 2015. Um, so the, the original class that I mentioned at the beginning was, uh, create, was originally created at 2015 and there were about three instructors. Um, the review process was spun up in 2016, um, and it was run by one person, not me, uh, for two years. In 2018, I, I essentially took over the effort, and it was run by me and me alone for about a year. And then, um, and then I added a couple other volunteers because I couldn't keep up. Um, and, and actually, I was a volunteer at that point. I had another job, um, which was I was the TL for the auto generation of client libraries 
for, for APIs. What got me into this was that we were having trouble with all the snowflakes. And I was like, we need to solve these problems upstream. And uh, we didn't really have a system for that. So I sort of had to create it. Um, so that happened in 2018. Um, I added volunteers for review. The AIPs were launched internally at the end of 2018 with only like 10 documents or something. And then in early 2019, we took our old cloud design guide, refactored it all into the AIP system. It was launched publicly in May of 2019, I believe May 15th. I might be a little off on that. Um, after that was done, I spent June and July writing more guidance based on reviews. And then uh, in August or so of 2019, I started work on the Linter in earnest. Um, it was finished in um, 20 in December. Um, it took a little bit longer than it might have because I had to teach myself Go in the process. Um, so it was finished in December. Um, it became mandatory at Google in January of 2020. Um, so all this process, the education process started in 2015, the review process started in 2016, and then the guidance and automation process started in 2019, uh, really at the beginning of 2019. So it took about a year to get to that spot. Um, now I keep, now my job includes keeping the lights on for that stuff um, and also figuring out, you know, new patterns and new things about where our APIs are going, which is what I've been doing since January. Oh, cool. Um, we got one from Nicholas. Um, I see you have a GitHub site. Do you use PRs to version? Yes. Um, so everything is done with pull requests. We don't mirror, uh, we mirror the linter into Google's internal source control system, but we use Get, but GitHub is the source of truth for it. Um, it was a very specific decision that we did not want to mirror out. We wanted to mirror in. Um, we all source control for the AIP repo itself. The PRs are canonical. Um, we have considered versioning the AIPs. So there would be an idea of like, you are, you are, you know, going against the AIP 2.0 standard or 3.0 standard, or probably we'd date them. Actually, we'd probably do something like the, uh, like the Ubuntu system where you know, we do 2021.06 or something. And we release a version every month. Um, is I think what we're is what the working group is currently considering. We don't version them right now. Right now, it's sort of you know you just go to head and you see what you see and you look at pull requests for the history. Um, but there is a intent to almost certainly version them because the extension model basically can't work without them. Like if you go if you go fork and have you know my company here .aip .dev, you need to be able to get updates and you need to be able to know what it is that you're taking. Like if you're going to do this as as the building code for your company. Um, you need to know what the changes to the building code are and you, and cause you may be getting a change to the building code that you don't like, at which point you need to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this up, this, this, uh, this PR that changes things, but then I'm going to go do my own edit that undoes this thing that I don't actually want to take or that I contradict or whatnot. Yeah, true. Uh, we've got a couple more. Um, we're actually running a bit ahead of time, so you're lucky you're getting all these questions, Luke. Um, yeah, I know. Well, from, really. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, so Jason asks, um, how do you measure the quality and consistency of your APIs over time uh, to see if you need to intervene further? Uh, we don't do a very good job of that. Um, so we have CSAT surveys and such. Um, one challenge is that it's very difficult to change APIs once they go GA, and our GA and Google's GA process has a ton of pain. Um, you you have to go through an alpha and beta series, and like it's at the front of the URL, so every every user that that takes a beta has to like do migration to go to V1. Um, that results in a lot of undesirable things, like our betas tend to stay up for years because we can't get people off of them. Um, and it causes a lot of pain for API producers because our internal platform doesn't actually know anything about versioning. So the beta API and the GA API are two entirely different ones. Um, and that causes a lot of headache and boilerplate for our teams. Um, so we have this effort where we want to get things faster, out faster. Um, and so we're removing some of those restrictions, but then that has this risk that like once something goes GA, we're promising to our enterprise customers that it's stable and that you can write code against it and that you know, absent a disaster, that code will continue to work. So, um, so measurement on this is very hard. We, and 
but not only is measurement hard, but then taking action on anything that you learn is even harder. Um, so we have a lot of feedback that we've gotten from users and it's like, okay, well, great. Thanks for this feedback. Um, if it's important enough, we can do it in new APIs, but it's very difficult to handle making any of those changes in existing ones because those existing ones are, are contractual. We're working on, um, we're working on trying to code our way out of that problem, you know, by making versioning support better. Um, we're good. There's a desire to go refactor some of the oldest ones and try to get them up to code. Uh, but it's a big challenge and it's it's very difficult because it's again it's kind of more art than science so it's it's very difficult to get feedback of like whether it's very difficult to get feedback on whether or not our designs are good before they're permanent and it's also very difficult to get feedback on like am i any good at my job um because if i'm terrible at my job like what's the system to like tell me that like how do you how do you measure it um it's we we want to get better at that, but it's been a it's been a constant struggle. Yeah, I'm sure it's a struggle for most places. Um, we got one for us from Sorab. Um, are there justifications documented for each AIP in case you encounter in case you encounter more opinionated adversaries? That's a great question. Um, so believe it or not, uh, so we went back and forth on this um, originally. I wanted to publish justifications for every single thing that we said. And we had pushback against that because it made the document significantly longer. Um, so right now, for the most part, we don't justify our reasoning. Um, and I thought that was going to be hugely painful. And it largely hasn't been. Um, it has been painful on a couple of things. Um, there's a couple of things that keep coming up where we kind of have to go through the justification. There's at least one case where I need to go change something because the justification is just bad. And, and like, I've been convinced that it's bad and I need to go alter it. Um, but for the most part, we don't publish it because it makes things longer. And it turns out that for every particularly opinionated person that really wants that stuff, there are a hundred people that don't want the clutter uh, on the, uh, what they view as clutter. Uh, but on the other hand, what's interesting is the opinionated person cares a lot more. So you sort of have these like large numbers of soft opinions away from having that stuff and a small number of very um, hard opinions toward having it. Um, like I said, I'm actually one of the hard opinions toward having it, um, even though we haven't done it. Um, a thing that we've talked about is potentially adding a separate justifications page for each one. So like if you go to AIP.dev slash 131, you get here's how to do it. And if you go to AIP.dev slash 131 slash rationale, you get, here's the reason for this various kind of stuff. Um, we've also considered having like Wikipedia style talk pages. Um, none of those things are done, but, they're the, but they are things that we have considered doing. And we've largely considered them around that reasoning of there should be more of that like back and forth input. Um, you know, right now, the, right now this really mirrors something more like a legal you know, building code or something where you know, we just tell you what to do and, and you do it. Um, and if you don't want to do it, you get an exception. Um, and, and we'd like more give and take than we have right now. Um, so that's something that we'd like to have, uh, but we want to have it in a way that doesn't sacrifice the fact that, that most of these documents can be printed on at most two pages. And we want to figure out a way to get all those things without making all these docs 10 pages, um, because we found that the terseness of them uh, has been very widely communicated to us as being very helpful. That was a great question. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I think we've got time for one more. Uh, we go on from Roy. Um, is there a current community initiative, uh, Google, Netflix, IBM, uh, that could standardize on AIP approach or something similar to be able to include GraphQL and async APIs in the future? That is exactly what we're working on. Um, so there, that working group exists. Um, it has, you know, me or my counterpart from all of these various companies and usually a couple other people. Um, and that is a thing that we are actively working toward and, and, uh, and we want, and we're interested in more. So if there's anyone who's viewing this, um, that, that is interested in participating in this effort, um, you know, please reach out. Um, but yes, that is exactly where we're trying to get to. Cool. Um, I think that's all we have time for. Um, Luke, if you want to uh, put your email 
uh, perhaps in the chat. So if people want to reach reach out. Uh, yeah, um, my email is here. I'll put the slide up real fast, uh, and then let me go find this thing. Actually, oh, I guess it's is it the event tab? Or no, it's the stage uh, tab. The stage tab. Yep. Cool. Okay, I am putting my email there now. Uh, I also have it on the slide. Um, uh, and there's a, oh, I misunderstood Stephen's question when you asked it. The question was, is it going to consider supporting uh, linting open API and Swagger? I misunderstood the question. The answer to that question is yes. Um, we're actively working on supporting, on including open API, probably only three. We probably won't do two. Um, we're actively working on including open API three in the AIPs. So we're going to separate the interface at the top and then IDLs, you know, just like you see, you know, tabs for how to use the client li libraries in every language, you'll see tabs for here's how to like do this thing in each IDL. Um, and for each IDL that we have, we want to have a uh, linter as well. Cool. All right, we'll wrap up there. Uh, thanks again for your time, Luke. Really appreciate it. Um, and that concludes the morning block of speakers in the execution stream. So uh, thanks so much once again to all the speakers, Andrew, Greg, and Luke. I uh, really appreciate your willingness to share your wisdom and your expertise. Um, and thanks to everyone that's attended. I hope you enjoyed yourself and learned a thing or two along the way. I'm just, I know that I did. Um, so we have an hour's break now. So don't forget to get up, have a stretch, uh, grab a coffee, uh, go to gym. And while you, while you have the time, visit the booths of our sponsors in the Partners Village. Uh, thanks, everyone. My name's Emil. Um, I'll sign off there. So have a great rest of the day. And I encourage you to check out more API, more of the API Days conference over today and tomorrow. All the best.